Is my screen visible to you all? Yes, yes, it is. Okay, all right. So today we are going to start, uh, study about the Surface Eye Act and a brief overview in terms of its procedure. What are the topics that we are going to cover? First is the brief purpose of the Surface Eye Act 2002, then steps in terms of enforcement of the security interest, what are the remedies that the aggrieved person receives, and finally the draft of, of the application to DRT under Section 17. All right. Now the brief purpose of Surface Eye Act 2002. First is the, uh, the Surface Eye Act, what is the full form? The Securitization and Reconstruction of Financial Assets and Enforcement of Securities Interests Act was enacted with the intent to provide financial institutions. What includes the financial institution? Banks and other institutions, all right? To them, we give them the power to recover non-performing assets. And these financial institutions have a presence in India and are notified by the government of India through various circles by the RBI. Then the act provides for two broad methods for recovery. First is either taking the possession of the secured assets of the borrower or taking the management or the business of the borrowers until the recovery of these non-performing assets or NPAs. Next is steps in terms of enforcement of security interest. After the borrower's account is classified as a non-performing asset, the security a secured creditor, secured creditor in such a case would be the financial institution, must furnish a written demand notice to the borrower to discharge its liabilities within 60 days. All right. Then the demand notice shall contain the details of the amount payable by the borrower and the secured assets intended to be enforced by the secured creditor in the event of non-payment. And under which section is it mentioned? It is mentioned under section 13 clause 2 and 13 clause 3 of the Surface Eye Act. Then the borrower retains the right to make any representation. The borrower in this case would be the defaulter, the person who makes the default or the aggrieved party as such. He, he retains the right to make any representation or raise any objection against the notice to the secured creditor again within 60 days of the notice period. Uh, when they receive a, when the borrower receives a notice, then within 60 days of the notice period, he has the right to raise an objection or any representation. Then in such a case, the secured creditor must consider this objection. And if such an objection is raised or such a representation is made, then in such a case, the secured creditor comes to the conclusion that such objection is not acceptable or tenable. And if such, if the same is communicated, it has to be communicated within 15 days. All right. And with a reason. What is the reasons? The reasons for the non-acceptance of such, of such objection or such representation, which is made by the borrower. In which section is it mentioned? It is mentioned under section 30, 13, clause 3A. Now, the important point over here is that the rejection of the representation or the objection made by the borrower and the reasons communicate does not confer any right upon the borrower to file an application to the DRT or the court of district judge. Okay. Then after the receipt of the demand notice, the borrower cannot transfer by way of sale, lease or any of it, any of his secured assets referred to in the notice, the notice which is given to him by the secured creditor without prior written consent of the secured creditor, otherwise than in the ordinary course of his business. In which section is it mentioned? It is, men it is mentioned in section 13, clause 13. Then in the case where the secured debt is not discharged within the notice period of 60 days, then what can the secured creditor do? The secured creditor can then enforce the security interest and take one or more of the actions which is mentioned in 13 clause 4 of the act and the notice under 13 clause 4 is is supposed to be necessarily a possession notice so what includes section 13 clause 4 the right of the secured creditor to take possession of secured assets or take over the management of the secured assets or the business or appoint a manager or require a borrower's debtors who have acquired to pay who have acquired the secured assets to pay them in, that includes the guarantors of the borrower now in the case the dues of the secured creditors if they are not fully satisfied with the sale proceeds of the secured assets then by the measures as enumerated in section 13 clause 4 which i just stated 
the secured creditor they return a retain a right to file an application to the drt having jurisdiction the drt under which jurisdiction it falls under like for instance if if it has taken place in ahmedabad then the drt of ahmedabad would have the jurisdiction or any court with appropriate jurisdiction that is the chief metropolitan court or uh, the district magistrate in that in such a case for the recovery for the balance amount from the borrower all right after this comes the remedy now once this is the this is the side which has been completed by the financial institutions or the side of the secured creditor wherein the secured creditor has given the notice they have filed an application they have uh, maintained their side of the uh, issue now what comes next is the aggrieved party what does the aggrieved party have remedy in such a case after this comes the application under section 17 of the act which is to be filed before the debt recovery tribunal or the drt along with appropriate fees to be paid there is certain amount of fees that has to be paid through under section 17 itself and such a section 17 uh, such an application under section 17 is to be filed before the drt that application of the drt can only be filed if the notice is filed under section 134 if they have received a notice if the borrower has received a notice under section 134 or the borrower against the order of the drt which is mentioned under section 14 which is passed by the district magistrate or the chief metropolitan magistrate against him however if a if a borrower receives a notice under section 13 clause 2 then in such a case the borrower cannot approach the drt directly and shall have to wait until he receives a notice under section 13 clause 4 or section 14 now what are the remedies of an aggrieved person if the aggrieved person in this case would be the borrower against the secured creditor now application to drt within 45 days if the aggrieved person takes a, by any action taken by the secured creditor under certain clause 4 an application can be brought before the drt within 45 days from which such measure has been taken it has under which section is this mentioned it is mentioned under section 17 now such application can be filed before drt within the local limits of whose jurisdiction the now what is the jurisdiction of drt the jurisdiction of drt consists of uh, falls under three parts first is the cause of action whether wholly or in part in which it arose then is the secure where the secured asset is located and third whether the branch or any office of a bank or any other financial institution is maintaining an account in which the debt claimed is outstanding for the time being is present it is mentioned or the jurisdiction of drt is mentioned under section 17 clause 1a then what are the powers of drt the powers of drt are to declare the measures taken by the secured creditor as invalid order the restoration of possession of secured assets or management of secured assets to the borrower or the any other aggrieved person apart from the borrower then pass any other such directions as it may com- uh, consider appropriate this includes an order to make a compensation as enumerated under section 19 which section states this section 17 clause 3 now the application filed with drt it must be disposed within 60 days from which such an application is filed however upon the jurist- upon the consideration of drt he may- it may extend the set period for reason to which has to be recorded in writing for a maximum period of 4 months which section states this section 17 clause 5 however if the application is not disposed of within the period of 4 months another application has to be made before the debt recovery appellate tribunal for directing the drt for expedite expedite disposal of such an application now comes the appeal the appeal to dr 18 within 30 days now if a person is aggrieved by the order of drt then in such a case an appeal can be filed to debt recovery appellate tribunal within 30 days again it is ma- order made under section 17 now through section 18 lies the appeal if the aggrieved person the aggrieved person must deposit with the drtt a minimum of 50% of the amount debt due from him as claimed by the secured creditors or as determined by the drt whichever is less if uh, if the 50% amount is lesser or if the amount claimed by the secured creditors to be given that is less whichever is lesser is to be submitted before the drat however the drat also has the power to reduce the amount to minimum of 25% of debt after after recording the reasons in writing so now for reducing the amount from 50% to 25% 
the reasons has to be recorded in writing also if no presiding officer or a chairman is appointed at the time at the drt in in the drt in in drt dr 80 if there is no presiding officer or a chairman which has been appointed at, at that particular time then in such a case they agreed can go directly to the high court now here comes the application to drt under section 17 the draft of which we'll be sharing right now okay the draft of such an application is to be produced before subsection 6 of section 17 of the securitization and reconstruction of financial assets and enforcement of securities interest act that is surface i act and is provided under appendix 8 of rule 12 plus 2 of securities interest enforcement rules i'll be sharing the draft uh, with you shortly in the meanwhile i'll discuss with you a little brief of the overview of whatever we uh, whatever we heard right now first is the liability under agreement liability that arises out of the agreement between the financial institutions and the borrowers next is the default in the payment that is made by the borrowers then comes the declaration by the secured creditors of the borrower as a non-performing asset or the npa then after that the secured creditor files a demand notice under section 13 clause 2 to discharge the liability within 60 days now it, it is now divided, after this it can be divided into two parts. First, if there are objections raised by the borrower. Second, if there are no objections raised by the borrower. If objections are raised, then what happens? Then the borrower submits a representation to the secured creditor within 16 days, which is mentioned in section 13 clause 3. All right. Once it is accepted, then it ends over there. If it is not accepted, then what happens? If, if, if it is not accepted, then it is rejected with reasons within 15 days, 15 days of raising the objections by the borrower. The reasons have to be re uh, rejected by the secured creditors. Then what happens? Then comes the line in which the no objection part also comes, if no objections are raised. And then if objections are raised, these align at the same point, which is the same, which is the point over here. In such a case, the secured creditor acts under section 13 clause 4 can take one or more of the following steps which are the steps that can be taken secured creditor with the assistance of chief metropolitan magistrate or the metro or district magistrate in taking possession under section 14 can take which of one of the following steps each one or more of the following steps which are these steps first is taking possession of the secured asset then is taking over the management of the secured asset or such a business then is appointment of a manager and finally, require the borrowers, debtors who have acquired the asset to pay for them. After this, the aggrieved person taken by who has taken who is aggrieved by the action taken by the secured creditor files an application under Section 13 Clause 10. Then, after this, files an application in DRT with with the appropriate jurisdiction within 45 days. Now, DRT has the power. DRT has the power to declare the steps or actions taken by the secured creditor as invalid, restore the possession of the, asset, of the assets to the borrower or any other aggrieved party, then any other appropriate order or directions, including compensation which has to be paid under Section 19. Now, whoever is aggrieved by the order of this DRT under Section 17 can file an appeal to DR 80, which is Debt Recovery Appellate Tribunal under Section 18. What happens then? The appeal is to be filed within 30 days. Now I'll be sharing with you the draft of section 17. And uh, Setu here will be explaining the draft of section 17. And you can also ask your questions to her, right? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Can you see me? Now you must be able to see the draft as well. That one is... Right? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I'm sorry for that. So, uh, as you can see the draft, the first thing that you uh, see on the first page is that uh, you're supposed to mention if you're filing it before DRT1 or DRT2. Now, the difference between these two things are uh, if the matter or the cause of action is arising uh, in the district of Ahmedabad, then you're supposed to file uh, the securitization application before DRT1. And for every other district, you're supposed to go to DRT2, right? So that is the difference between DRT1 and DRT2. Uh, first you see is the name of the parties as applicants. Uh, 
Now it is important to note that uh, uh, whether there are borrowers or co-borrowers or guarantors, all of them who are mentioned in the notice of 13.2 and 13.4 are to be joined as the parties in the securitization, securitization application as well. And uh, the authorized officer of the respective bank that may be sending you the notice has to be made the respondent. Right, the index index shows the ap application of 17.1, then the VP that you're filing, uh, then the list of documents, and uh, the documents that are mentioned in the list of documents are to be uh, annexed there, okay, after that. Now the main draft starts. Are you able to see the screen? Yes. Okay. Good. So uh, then in the details of the application, first is the particulars of the applicants. They have to mention all the names of the parties that you made in the course title, then the addresses of the respective parties, then the details of the respondents. And the th third part is very important, the jurisdiction of the tribunal. Now, the cause of action is arising in the respective city. For example, it is Surat. So you have to mention uh, that it, the cause of action is arising in the Surat district. The bank is of Surat. The main head office is at so and so, so and so place. And that's why the jurisdiction is uh, lies with this uh, DRT tribunal, right? That para three is of jurisdiction. Then uh, schedule of the pro uh, property is mentioned. Now the property uh, on which you have taken the loan, the, wh whatever kind of loan or credit that is there, which is mortgaged at the time of taking it has to be mentioned in the schedule of the property, right? Then the limitation. Uh, as there's a limitation after receiving uh, the notice of 13.4, section 13.4, you have a time of 45 days for filing the securitization application under section 17.1, right? So you have to mention here that uh, you received uh, the notice dated 13.2 on so-and-so, so-and-so date. Then you received the notice of 13.4 on so-and-so, so-and-so date. And that's why, and you are filing it within the time. This is an important uh, para for the limitation purposes. Now, what happens is uh, in some cases, you may not be able to file the application within 45 days. For that, you, are, you need to move the uh, application for condemnation of delay. You have to uh, count the delay from 45 days to uh, the date of your filing. Then you have to mention the delay, the reasons of delay, and you have to move it with the securitization application, correct? Then the facts. Uh, now, this is uh, what happens is the drafts rely uh, differ from offices to offices and facts uh, facts to facts. Okay, right now, this is very basic that I've mentioned here. First is you have to mention uh, chronologically, you have to go where did, when did you take the loan, what kind of loan it was, for the how much amount the loan was taken, from which bank it was, what all properties did you mortgage for that loan. Those are details you have to mention. Then what was the amount of EMI? What was the amount of interest that you were paying? That is, the, those are the details that you have to mention. Then you go, why the failure of payment of EMIs? Now, in the first place, you uh, as a borrower or the co-borrower have been defaulting, right? That's why you are going, uh, receiving the notices and moving the application to DRT. So you have to mention since what time and when did you start not paying the EMIs and default started? That has to be mentioned. Details of the notices, the 13.2 uh, notice, when did you receive it? The notice of section 13.4, when did you receive it? If you file in certain cases, you have filed reply to 13.2 or 13.4. That reply has to be annexed here with uh, that you have raised some objections that your notice was not under the measures of uh, surface I Act. Those are things you mentioned, correct? And you annex all these things as well. And then comes uh, the details of NP and further details. Now, uh, what happens is uh, as soon as you start defaulting in your loan, whatever it is, the term loan or home loan, whatever it is, uh, after a point of time, according to the guidelines of RBA, your uh, account, the loan account, becomes the non-performing asset. They'll declare it non uh, NPA, right? So you have to mention that detail as well. When did, you, when did your account uh, uh, was declared as NPA and details regarding that? Correct. These are all factual details. You have to go chronologically from loan to the end of the process, right? Then comes the grounds. Under what grounds you're challenging these notices? What happens is in section 17.1, where you're uh, moving the securitization application, 13.2 and 13.4, these notices have to be uh, challenged. And you have to show the uh, respective tribunal that where was the default by the respondent bank in what uh, terms did they not take the 
proper measures in sending you the notice those all your uh, those all grounds will be uh, taken up here right uh, if your account was declared npa and you were not notified about the same and uh, guard, guidelines regarding regarding the npa account and rbit guidelines then the judgments regarding the 13 2013 whatever you are challenging judgments regarding the same these things will be covered in the ground after that the reliefs come okay first you need to challenge the 132 then you need to challenge the 134 if the 13 it's uh, 134 is necessarily the possession notice so in the relief you also mention that if you are challenging the so and so so and so uh, notice of 134 dated whatever the date is and uh, you request the court and you pray before the court to restore the possession back to the uh, applicants as well that also you refer to the relief referring the relief uh then you ask for the pray for the cost of the uh, respective application and any other uh, prayers that is standard in any draft correct then comes the interim relief right in in interim relief you uh, pending the disposal uh, disposal of the securitization application if your position is taken and uh, bank is supposed to take the position on so and so so and so fixed date if there are any proposal for auction also you ask for the interim relief that until the final disposal of the securitization the main application these uh, relief may be granted to be uh, as in when the disposal of the securitization application come comes the interim relief uh, may be vacated it's like interim application it's like stay until the final disposal of any application you ask for an interim relief so that is this relief okay then you uh, in a standard manner you uh, uh, disclose it to the court that uh, other than this application you have not filed any other application before any other court now if you uh, in certain cases you directly approach high court in, depending upon the emergency or whatever then you have to mention that as well because once you have uh, approached any other tribunal or court or honorable court in that case the other parallel proceedings cannot uh, go uh, simultaneously right so you have to mention that also then the particulars of bank draft or postal order now uh, what are these when you are filing the application under 17 you have to uh, pay the fees uh, to the tribunal the details of those fees court fees have to be mentioned here and in the, in what name you are uh, uh, paying the fees what are the exact uh, what is the amount exact amount of the fees that all you have to mention here and then comes the list of enclosures that's it all right is any questions by your side any of you does any of you have any questions regarding the draft or the explanation that is that was given by shivani you are able to hear me yeah is there any question no ma okay up oh, you are smart people you got everything in the first go good so shall i end it now or is there any question final time perfect then all right i'm ending the meeting here thank you so much on behalf of shivani as well and we'll see you in the next lecture